Okay, guys, welcome back to Slasher Street Podcast, and I am delighted to be joined by yet another special guest. Uh, he is the director of the upcoming uh, Queer Jalo Short Bath Bomb, which is making the waves online at the moment with the Indiegogo campaign, which as of this minute is still live. But once we drop this, it's probably only going to be live for another day or so. Uh, so make sure you support that Bath Bomb on Indiegogo. And that is, of course, Mr. Colin G. Cooper. Colin, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Awesome. I am. Uh, obviously, it's not, but your middle name is perfect for the genre <laughs> that you are going to be making films in. Colin Jalo Cooper. That's not yeah. like it, but that and would be the yeah. first person to to suggest to suggest that. Yeah, yeah. Just as soon as I saw the G, I was like, perfect. <laughs> So obviously we're here to talk Bath Bomb, we're here to talk all of that great stuff, which we will absolutely, absolutely get into. Uh, but before we do, icebreaker question uh, that we ask everyone on the show, basically, how did you fall in love with horror? Kind of what is your, you know, earliest horror memory? Well, uh, interestingly, it coincides with your, your show, the, t the title of your show. Uh, when I was... I don't re remember if I was four or five, but I had a babysitter who was um, not the bravest of souls. And my parents had um, Beetlejuice on VHS, not like purchased. It had been recorded from television. Oh, okay. And I was watching that and he, this babysitter, was afraid of that movie. So he went upstairs and left me downstairs watching it alone and he fell asleep and at, after Beetlejuice my parents had recorded the original Nightmare on Elm Street af <laughs> after Beetlejuice and um, so I ended up watching I just continued watching because I was a little kid and figured okay and and you know I ended up watching that at, at four or five years old which is too young to be watching that movie and I ended up having uh, sleep paralysis Oh my episodes god! Episodes from that age until I was twelve, um, where Freddie was—you know—some people during sleep paralysis episodes see a figure, and ah. I would see him, and it's just the moment when he's like, you know, waving with his—he would be standing like kind of, not just at the end of my bed, but at the wall that was opposite the end of my bed. Yeah, uh, doing that, and then sometimes he would kind of like walk up to the bed. And I'd snap out of it before he actually did anything. And then after age after age twelve, they I still had uh, sleep paralysis episodes, much much less frequently, but um, they still happened. And, but he was no longer in them. Oh my god! Now, did you watch any of the sequels before you were twelve, or did that just completely shut you off? Because I think if you watched some of the sequels, maybe that would have made it a little more lighthearted. Yeah, so no, I didn't. I didn't watch any. It was so bad that we used to have this um, video rental store where I grew up called Bandito Video. Video, and you know when things were being promoted, sometimes they had like the life size cardboard cutouts of yeah of uh, different you know action stars or whoever. There was one time that we were trying to go in, my brother and I, and probably one or both of my parents. And there was a Freddy sequel coming out and there was a Freddy cutout. And I saw it before we entered the store, just through the window. And I wouldn't even go in the store. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, but, it, uh, it, does, it does fuck you up. Like, I remember watching it when I was nine, I think, nine or ten. And, yeah, like, I, it, it got me that the first scene where he jumps up, uh, you know, from in the boiler room that I was. It yeah. Just, yeah. I think I think it's for, out of any slasher movie uh, of the franchises, the big ones. I think that is the worst one a kid could watch because of the killing you in your dreams thing. And yeah. even though the cast is older, he's still a child killer. Yes. So, yeah. It wasn't great. It totally. It is. It totally is like just oh, uh, like and I think that really was probably the first one. I think I maybe saw the exorcist before that but yeah it's definitely like either the first or the second horror film that i ever watched was and i, I think it was the first I, i've kind of put it on record on the podcast that it was the first it was probably a one or the other but yeah it was completely messed me up and uh sleep paralysis i mean i actually get sleep i've never used to get sleep paralysis when i was little but i get it now and yeah. i hate it. oh it's the worst as soon as you get that it's just 
it's the worst. I once, in fact, a couple of, was it a month ago? Um, my wife was in bed and she got up to come out, get, to kind of get up with our little girl. And um, I felt someone get back into the bed with me and kind of like whisper stuff to me, like really sinister stuff. And I just couldn't move. I was just frozen. And my wife wasn't in the room and it was the most, like, it just completely got me. I was just didn't yeah. get any sleep that night. Sleep paralysis is, oh, it's not, a, it's not a thing to mess with. Do you still get that now or is it just? Uh... I I very occasionally. I haven't had an episode in an um. I think um, the last episode that I had was uh, in like a real episode. Sometimes mm -hmm. I get like, it'll happen for a little bit, like very mm -hmm. brief episodes. But the last time I had a real episode was in, in 2018. And I was actually out in the middle of a pretty secluded lake on a, on a boat with friends. Uh, and that was a bad environment to have it in. Cause yeah. it's, I think that was part of what, what made, no, no, no. I know what made me have it again. Actually, it was Mike Flanagan. And it's because um, the haunting of Hill House with a character that has sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, that's bad that he did that or anything, but it was a very accurate portrayal of sleep paralysis in my yeah. opinion. And it just made me think of it a lot. Again, I hadn't thought of it in, in a while. And that, and that I had, uh, I had a, a few episodes of it after having watched that that series. But I really love that portrayal of sleep paralysis. And yeah, I'm glad that it's out there. And a lot, a lot of people started talking about sleep paralysis more when that came out. Um, Absolutely, which is good. That is a heartbreaking series as well. Like it's terrifying throughout, but then when you get to the end, it's just heartbreaking. And then when you rewatch it, like we rewatched it straight away, and you see it in a totally different light. It's I think. The Hill House one, not as I, I love the Bly Manor one, but the Hill House one, I just think is an absolute masterpiece. It's just yeah. phenomenal. I, I think I do think that um, Midnight Mass is his his best. Yeah, Midnight Mass that was awesome as well, and what he did with the uh, Doctor Sleep, like the Flannyverse is just. Like, I really liked uh, Midnight Club, and was pretty pissed that it didn't get continued. I still haven't seen the Midnight Club. It's on my list of things to check out. And I think the fact that it got cancelled actually kind of maybe put me off it a little bit, but it shouldn't have done. But um, but yeah, yeah everyone I, said it was really good. I'd be curious to hear the story behind the cancellation. I mean, I I guess I believe that it wasn't watched by as many people, but it just seems unlikely because it, mm. it, it was excellent. And, and I would have thought that it would have pulled in younger people as well because of the age of the cast, but... Yeah, maybe, maybe not, the case. not to go uh, too off topic, but I think I heard that he had signed some sort of contract with Amazon Prime and he was going to do a movie for Prime and then Netflix kind of threw the toys out the pram and just cancelled all of his stuff because up until that point, the majority right. of his stuff was all Netflix stuff. Right. How true that is, I, I don't know. I, any, any story that involves corporate entities acting like children, I believe. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so anyway let's get uh back on to talking about back on to talking about yourself so um i was actually gonna ask as well do you have any like personal favorite horror films out there or anything uh that really sticks out to you i have a hard time choosing favorites um original nightmare on elm street is still is a favorite i didn't watch it again until i was 27 but um i, I love that movie now um technically not a horror i don't know depends on who you are and what you consider or it's certainly horrific is a uh, lost highway and um that is actually the film that made me want to be a filmmaker and still one of my favorite films still my favorite um lynch film and then anything beyond that is kind of i just go year by year yeah <laughs> also i can't believe so that that really messed you up that nightmare on elm street watch when you were little really messed you up 27 yeah. Well, I did watch, I watched the rest of the, this, I watched all of the sequels uh, oh, okay. in my teens and, and, and 20s, and, but still was not re comfortable returning to the original, uh, but then, <laughs> I, then I watched it at 27. Yeah. It did, oh, it's still, when I watched it again, I was, uh, because especially after watching the sequels, which, you know, a lot of them are not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah watch and i watched like the series stuff too where it was just ridiculous they were just trying to turn him into a comedian and um the the original is really good like it's not just the best of that that's a really that's a good movie by yeah. any, by any standard and um 
very original and 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 intelligent not just not just original uh yeah and yeah that the opening sequence of that film is is still some of the most terrifying shit in in cinema <laughs> I agree. I agree. And the scene where uh, Amanda uh, Vice's character gets uh, dragged down the school hallway. That's still... Oh my God. I've, so, I've, I've pitched the concept of... Uh, I don't care if someone steals this now because it's been so long, but I want to do a, a music video and I've pitched this to artists before and nobody's ever taken it. Of, um, I think it would be best with hip hop where the the person who's who's rapping is you're like close on their face while they're rapping but they have the plastic bag over them and then you you pull out and they're being dragged down a school hallway by by nothing oh, leaving yeah. the trail of blood <laughs> and that's their <laughs> performance right i think that would be awesome that would be that that would fit perfectly with uh, well I suppose, like, like you say, rap, but also metal or anything like that, that would work. Yeah, I just think with rap, you can metal would be too high energy, which kind of betrays the creepiness of it. Rap, rap would be nice, especially yeah. if it's, it's there. You know, one of various artists, somebody like a Tyler the Creator, for instance, would be. Uh, I think I pitched it to like Flatbush Zombies or somebody like that. Um, but yeah, because there are like horror rap groups as well that that would yeah. be nicely. Because that actually um, that's actually segueing nicely into the next part. So, but the next question I had really was, how did you kind of get into filmmaking? Because mm. you are, you know, very well known for you know directing music videos and and all that great stuff. You've done some uh, with uh, with rap, with with metal, and a, a, like a good variety of uh, different kind of things on the CV there. So, how did you get into it all, basically? Um, so I I went to film school in uh, in vancouver um and then i wanted to direct and edit and by the time that i had left film school the, the sorry i'm getting notifications i don't know if you're oh, cool. <laughs> um da -da -da. i'm just gonna tell him to stop yeah <laughs> that's all good <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, so uh, by the time I finished film school, the path for editing kind of an opening presented itself. So that's what I jumped into because, you know, the opportunity was there. And I was an assistant editor for several years and then I started editing. I, I started in like the made for TV movie world. And um, it, much later moved to toronto in 2011 and i was still working in television at the time um i had i had switched over to what they call unscripted you know like reality television lifestyle television and was doing like food network stuff which i actually really loved doing and then a friend of mine was a manager for for a local hip-hop artist here in toronto called tasha the amazon and he needed a music video for her for her first solo music video she had been part of a pop group before and that was going off to do solo hip-hop stuff mm -hmm. so i did that and then her and i became close and i was making all of her videos and a f several years later in 2016 we had the opportunity to make one of her videos for like some real money like have, have a real budget behind it and in canada we have um you know, much music is like our MTV and we okay. have the much music video awards, MMBAs, which are like our um, MTV VMAs. And the, this first video that, that we uh, had the first time that we had a, a, a good size budget, we were nominated for an MMBA and then won the MMBA for best hip hop video that year. And it's a pretty big thing. It's like, it was that year it was hosted by Alessia Carr and one of the Jonas Brothers and you know like Lord is performing and Iggy Azalea and um, so it's a, a pretty big thing and so because of that then you know agencies know who you are and approach you and so then I signed with an uh, an agency here in Toronto and that's how I worked for you know bigger artists like um, Jesse Reyes and 
Silverstein and Under Oath, which are the metal you were referencing. Yeah. Uh, and a bunch of bunch of other folks. But um, I, I continued doing TV uh, at the same time because um, obviously music video work is intermittent. It's not like a full time job. And um, I've, I've kind of slowed down on the music video stuff. Um, not to go, I don't want to go down a tangent in, in that, but it's, uh, it's just the music industry is a, it's a difficult landscape to navigate. <laughs> yeah. 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 I am a promoter here in Carlisle. I put gigs on here and, uh, yeah, like I, without even, it, it is, it's such a, at the moment, a difficult, difficult business to be in, but, uh, it is a fun business to be in as well. So, you know, yeah. I'm not I mean, I well. love, I love the experience you know especially artists who are really into the concept as well and want to work with you on making the concept instead of just mm -hmm. listening to a bunch of pitches and going that one i like i like it when the, the artist is involved it, it's really rewarding in the end and unlike working in television you're not i mean it changes from from situation to situation but there's never a situation in TV where you're just left alone in yet from in my experience, just left alone to do whatever you want. And then they mm -hmm. will put out whatever you did. And I, I really don't think that happens. I mean, it, it probably used to happen. Maybe the nineties was the last time it happened. I don't think that's happening. Even if you're, you know, like we were talking about Mike Flanagan, I'm sure yeah. there are still people giving Mike Flanagan notes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if, if you know, if in, I've worked in situations in music videos where there is no one giving notes, the, the person's, the label and the management for the artist trust them enough and are letting them steer the ship enough that it's just you and the artist and what you make together, that's what gets released. And that's incredibly rewarding. That's kind of like the best you can ask for creatively. And I'm, I don't know where it exists outside of music videos, which is why I will still, I'm still interested in doing them. I just don't mm -hmm. do them as much because I've gotten burned out on the uh the number of situations where it's not that case and you have like in the last cut you have notes coming from somebody you know email address you haven't seen and you ask the man who is this person it's like somebody who works in like artist relations at the label just wanted to have their moment you know they wanted to give their little two cents and it's like well why are we paying it to and you actually want me to pay attention to this it's uh very frustrating yeah, yeah, because um, so you do quite a lot in music as well, still. Or do because you, you I read or heard uh, that you also are on the team, or whether you are kind of the man behind the Psycho Music Festival in Psycho um, Las Vegas. Psycho yeah. Las Vegas, yeah. I'm definitely I, not the man behind, but <laughs> and, and I work. I've worked with Psycho um, since. 2016 um mm -hmm. ronnie exley who is also executive producer of bath bomb he is one of the man like the oh, okay. the mysterious there's essentially four mysterious dudes behind the curtain that run that and he's one of the four and um the, well really two who are like the the actual day-to-day -day putting things together dudes and he is one of those two um but yeah i've been working with them for a while and and some of the stuff that i've done um and that's kind of easing out of music videos. I had an opportunity to do some music content that was through them. So I wasn't really working with labels. I was working with them, which was, uh, it was a digital series, um, a documentary series on, on Motorhead, which is like different bands doing like paying tribute to Motorhead, talking about how Motorhead influenced their career and then um, ending the episode with a performance of, of a cover of a Motorhead song. And it was a pretty varied group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and for um, uh, Ace, are you familiar with Motorhead? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. For, for Ace of Spades, we did like a, instead of just having one band, it was like a supergroup type situation. So we had like Phil Anselmo doing uh, the vocals, uh, Gary Holt from Exodus, and also Slayer um, playing lead guitar, and um, Nick Oliveri played bass and also did vocals on a, on, on one of the um, on one verse on the second verse. Um, who else was in that? About just a bunch of great folks. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. That, that, that big hitters, big hitters in the metal world. So is metal kind of your your bag more than kind of hip hop or anything like that? Or is that just kind of, are you a mixture of everything kind of guy? Or? I would say metal and metal adjacent, which, okay. which includes some hip hop, you know. Uh, 
just the you know the genres are trickier now so that's why i say metal adjacent and um i mean even at, at psycho you know we have a pretty varied like we serve kind of more niche genres in general but mm -hmm. it's 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 predominantly metal but there's a lot of stuff that is not technically metal but metal people are definitely into um, yeah and that's that's kind of where i sit as well that's awesome. Yeah, I'm the same. Like anything kind of metal, uh, pop, I say pop punk. <laughs> pop punk is just kind of my total bag. I know like that's totally not metal or anything like that, but like <laughs> pop punk is like, is totally my bag. Uh, you know, oh, Slam Dunk Festival over here and everything. That's kind of my, but uh, you know, I'm also a thrash guy as well. I've got a, I've got, uh, have you ever heard of Gamma Bomb? No, I have not. They're a big Irish thrash metal band. I've got them playing Carlisle later this year. So okay, cool. very excited about that one. And uh, um, kind of, I've got a, who else have I got playing? I've got a band called Fenomare, who are a French uh, melodic death metal band. So that's kind of like nice. uh, quite a, a mixture of people I try and bring it to Carlisle. It's uh, <laughs> to uh, varied success. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not a melodic death metal fan. I'm a death metal fan, not a melodic death metal fan. I'm uh I don't listen to a ton of thrash. I have some like thrash loves that that I listen to, and they're, they're not even that <laughs> popular. But do you know Midnight? Ah, uh, no, no, not heard of them. They're like they're like a Cleveland thrash and speed metal uh, group that um, they wear like executioners masks when they. Oh, okay. <laughs> they're they're just a fucking blast. <laughs> they're they're hilarious. I actually went to a sh one of my favorite recent shows just because it was so small and awesome is um i think it's called audio in glasgow it's oh like, yeah you know, yeah, yeah they played audio and you know that i don't know what that room fits like 60 people like, it's it's it, a small it, venue yeah. yeah it's there's no way and so and because there's not a barricade or anything and the sp space is just like you know stage bar yeah. bathroom <laughs> <laughs> exit so the whole thing just turned into a, a mosh pit it was like there was if you didn't want to mosh, you needed to leave. There was no <laughs> way you could get anywhere else. And uh, you know they wear their like masks, and they really don't like to show who they are because they're in other bands and it's like secret. And this girl like stayed or surfed to the front and like reached up to the lead singer's mask, and he like palmed her head like it was a basketball and just like shoved her. <laughs> <laughs> And it looked, you know, it looked like, oh, that probably hurt. But after the show, outside when everyone's smoking, she was just like telling anybody who would listen about about. It. She was so excited that she got like sh shot to the floor by the least. Yeah, <laughs> they like they, they walked out, like crawled over people off stage and like standing on the bar and playing. It's just they're very rowdy in general, but usually play larger spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool to see them in like a unnecessarily small space. Yeah. That's awesome. So were you just here on a holiday or were you here for music or was there a yeah, I was... It was only like an hour up the road from me? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. I should have came visit you. I, yeah. uh, <laughs> I've, I was there for a mix of, of work and, and pleasure. And uh, in, in Glasgow, I decided to, to see several shows. Um, this isn't metal, but you know, you know, Peaches. Yes, I have them. Yeah. Yeah, so she, been, yeah. she was she was playing as well, and I went to that show, and that was one of the best shows, not just that I saw that year, but that I've ever gone to. Oh, she, I don't know if you've heard of this, her new tour. It was it's like the I forget how many year anniversary of um, her first album, Teaches of Peaches, which is has the song "Fuck the Pain Away," which is still probably her most famous song. But she the 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 show itself, the stage production was amazing. She had a giant, you know how like the Flaming Lips the Wayne does like the big like hamster ball that rolls out over the audience and he's inside it, the inflatable ball. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 So she did a giant inflatable dick that extended <laughs> out over the audience. And then she, she walks in it like it's see-through. She walks through the shaft of the penis while singing and then gets to the end of it. And there's a hole in the end and she shoots fake jizz out <laughs> the end of the, the cock on the crowd. It was just, it was, it was amazing. That is awesome. That is awesome. That, that's uh, the the closest I've seen. That is Ramstein. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. do a similar thing. They do a similar thing. Now, funny. I we're kind of going off topic here, but oh, I had a, a 
about five or six years ago, I had a I, I, I was the main booker of a really small uh, rock club in Carlisle, and I booked a Ramstein tribute band. And uh, obviously, where Ramstein would normally have the giant kind of cock that would shoot out the 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 foam, and everyone would get going. This guy had uh, kind of like a you know like a, a mini car cleaner that it shoved <laughs> like this this kind of. It was it was probably about this big. So it was like this this right. miniature kind of <laughs> cock and balls, and then it just kind of soaked everyone with the uh, <laughs> with the with the foam. It was just absolutely fucking hilarious. Like in the, just like right. what is going on? What is going on? This is the perfect Rammstein trivia. <laughs> it fits for being a cover band. It's like you know exactly do on the same scale as the real band. You got to do the cover band size version <laughs> exactly and that's kind of what he said he goes you know we are a tenth of the price of rammstein and you get a tenth of the show <laughs> so oh, just brilliant brilliant stuff uh excellent so anyway we'll we'll we, we've got kind of 25 minutes there uh so we will absolutely get into bath bomb so let, let's let's talk about bath bomb now sure i've wrote a bit well just kind of copied the synopsis uh from the Indiegogo campaign. So before we get into it, uh, the Indiegogo campaign, that is live. It's closing tomorrow night, which is Friday night, um, 3 a.m. your time. Eastern so, time, yep. Uh, yes, 3 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so people watching, listening to this, you haven't got long to back it, unless, of course, it reaches its goal tomorrow. Um which is hopeful. Hopefully, we'll still get there. So, yeah. but if you read, if you watch this straight away, you're we're at, definitely we're at eighty-eight percent right now. So we're doing. Oh shit! So that's really close. We're with doing, yeah. a day to go. That's awesome. So, yeah. so you have time. Well, not much time, but you have yeah. time to go and back it. So, um, so yeah. In terms of what it said on the Indiegogo campaign, I, I absolutely love this uh, little synopsis that is on here as well. So, it was Bath Bomb is a proposed short film written by Michael Clifton and directed by. Yourself, Colin G. Cooper, with the intention of establishing a queer approach to the cinematic sub genre known as Jalo. Um, it's about Jordan and Grant. Jordan is a sullen doctor with a refined manner. Grant is his beefy himbo boyfriend, and Jordan prepares an obstent. I can't even read what a ostensibly romantic bath for Grant, but it takes a disturbing turn after Jordan reveals that he knows Grant has cheated on him. There's delicious violence, sexy man flesh, and a ju uh, judicious amount of campy humor. So I'm really excited about this. Now, I read an, before, I read an, uh, read, <laughs> listened to an interview that I think you did a couple of weeks ago now, where this is a, it's a five minute short. Is that correct? Correct. That is a lot to fit into five minutes. That is a lot to fit into five minutes. Like just that synopsis, I'm like, that's going to be like 15, 20 minutes. Like, that's yeah. gonna... <laughs> because um, that's so... the, the best way. I mean, I don't know if I always agree with this, but the 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 shortest way to tell a story is the best way. And I, I with a short, I just feel like you gotta um, get in, say what you want to say, and get out. And uh, and I also think shorts that have a bit of like a punchline quality to them tend to mm -hmm. be the most effective. And we're also this, the intention of the short is to, you know, it's, this is like the beginning of like a universe of Giallo that we're trying to birth. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're really just like, we just want this to be, this could be a scene taken from any of these other Giallo that we're, we're going to make. Yeah. So, so we didn't want to, waste time that didn't need to to be there this is just a scene the conflict happens all within one scene you're done awesome very very exciting stuff and from that as soon as uh, i think you emailed me and i checked it all out i was like man that sounds absolutely awesome so um now before we get into it in detail um we kind of touched on it before we recorded the podcast. Now I'm just going to put my hands up here right now. And uh, as sacrilegious as this is, um, I'm not much of a Jalo kind of uh, expert by any means. I, in fact, as far as I'm aware, I'm, I, I think I've seen like maybe two or three uh, Jalo movies and even a couple of them. I'm unsure if they even are Jalo films. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, uh, you know, you're going to have to walk me through this um, a little bit. So, just for the purpose of the listeners and I suppose for, for myself as well, uh, what is a, a, a Jalo film as a genre? Uh, and also, what is a kind of a queer Jalo film? So, what would be the, the difference between the two? Right. Uh, 
because it's quite a, it's as far as I'm aware, this is a kind of a, a fresh ground that we are looking at, or maybe not so much, but they're pretty I'll close. Take the... fresh. I'll let you know. So, so Giallo is, is it's funny to even do this because the, uh, there are amongst the community of people who know Giallo, which is a pretty big community and tends to include a lot of filmmakers. Cause it was, it was influential on a lot of prominent filmmakers. Um, there's a lot of debate over specific films, whether or not they qualify as Giallo. And it's mostly because Giallo is, it's, it's like a three part thing. There's varying degrees of, um, I'm going to cough. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's, there's varying degrees of horror, murder, mystery, and erotic thriller. So some of them lean almost completely into one of those pockets, but they include all of them. And even if it's just like little hints of the other, other mm -hmm. ones. And it, it was developed in, in Italy in the late sixties, became mainstream popular in Italy in 1971 because of Argento's um, bird with a crystal plumage. And that started like the golden era of Giallo, which pretty much ended by the mid seventies. There were still some Giallo films being made after that, but they weren't of the same quality, except for a, a handful that were made by like the heavy hitters, which mm -hmm. would be Argento and, and really post 1975, like Fulci was the only other heavy hitter who was still making them. A, a lot of, folks say that the, the true like death of giallo was um i think 1982 which was the same year argento made tenebrae mm -hmm. and um fulci made um uh, the new york ripper and those were the last two like great giallo films that were made although saying that the new york ripper is great is a stretch <laughs> tenebrae <laughs> is great tenebrae is a great film um and they, after Argento, they, they leaned more into the body count um, aspect of, of, of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that became, that's what started influencing uh, American cinema. And Americans kind of took Giallo and turned it into uh, slasher but removed a lot of the, um, a lot of other elements of it. Um, so I, I guess maybe listing some titles also helps too. Have you, do you know Deep Red? Are you familiar with that? I'm in terms of the titles that I've seen, I've seen Suspiria. Okay. So, so that's all right. So Suspiria is technically not Giallo. <laughs> so, <laughs> but th as i say that there are people who'll be like it's totally jello so uh -huh. there's there's a because there are narrative elements that make something a jello but jello also had a pretty specific visual language those things are hard to separate and that's where arguments happen suspiria mm -hmm. has the visual language of a jello but it's not narratively a jello because there's not really a murder mystery mm -hmm. it's like kind of like you want to know who's doing the killings, but it's not like that's what you're trying to solve in the film. It And, um, and it's also supernatural, which mm -hmm. is kind of when things shift into like a post giallo. Oh, okay. Although f there's a movie called phenomena. I don't know if you're familiar. I've not seen that. No, no, no. Like Jennifer Connelly's first film is one of the things it's famous for. That one has some supernatural qualities too, because she can like, communicate with insects through her mind but um it's still considered a giallo even by the most stringent of critics mm -hmm. um what were, were were others so well a one that i don't think is a giallo but it's a fulci film is a zombie now i would say that's not a giallo because it's obviously not a mystery but it has some as far as i can see some stylistic things that maybe would kind of fall into a genre. Yeah. the music being one the uh the eye kill you know that's something right. and the kind of um there's there's things that happen in that film it's um 
erotic in some places, you know, as well in some right. scenes. So that is made by someone who is well known for Jalo films, but not right. technically, I would say. I would say that might probably not fall as a Jalo, but that is, no, that is definitely not a Jalo, but um you are right in that it has some of the uh some of the um stylistic elements. So when we're when you're talking about the erotic thriller elements of Giallo, you know the movie Basic Instinct? Yeah, yeah. Basic Instinct is essentially an American movie that is what many like narratively what many of the um erotic thriller Giallo films were were. <coughs> and so if a movie has erotic elements that's not the same as being like an erotic thriller you know what i mean where, mm -hmm. where, where mm -hmm. the eroticism is part of the plot you know the the sexual relationships between two people is, is part of the plot or more than two people a bunch of people um yeah but um suspiria is probably is 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 a better closer example to gel and like i said some people w would argue that is gel because it has the visual language a yeah. lot of the things visually that giallo set up was like using bold colored lighting often contrasting bold colored lighting um and so a lot of which people now use today um that it that was really kind of started by mario bava with this movie called uh, Blood and Black Lace, which is mm -hmm. the first like color, full color Giallo film, um, using um, w when you have the the killer, if if it's one that has a body count and there's a killer, um, seeing from the killer's POV, that's a Giallo thing. Um, black gloves, leather gloves that are seen in close-ups, that's a Giallo thing. The bl the blade, it's off. A lot of times it was a, a you know a straight razor but it later evolved to knives or scalpers, but like anything else shown in inserts as well. That's a jello thing. Seeing people being killed in inserts, you know, cut together inserts instead of like a, a wide shot of it. Oh, that's, okay. a, that's a jello thing. And all of these, obviously, as I'm saying, them are very obviously now slasher tropes, but they, those were all taken from, from jello. Yeah. Um, things like the killer is on the phone. That's jello. Um, talking to the killer on the phone and the killer reveals that he's watching you. He's obviously outside her house. Oh, that's Giallo. Um, on the erotic thriller side of things, there is a lot of them were you have a heterosexual female protagonist um, who there's, there's a queer female antagonist that kind of lures her away from, or at least tempts her away from the, straight and narrow path of mm -hmm. being married or, or whatever she has going on in her life. Um, that's a, a giallo thing. A lot of times that also involved like um, technically not incest, but like step stepbrothers and stepsisters who were uh, sexually involved with each other. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, giallo, when, when those, when the erotic thriller stream and the body count stream merged, you would have those elements in the same movie. So you would have this erotic uh, narrative going on, but also there were people being murdered by a black glove killer that you never saw. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And the, Very cool. the, the outfit of the killer even was standard. It was a, a trent, black trench coat, fedora, black leather gloves. Sometimes they wore surgical gloves instead, which is what we're doing. But, um, and it, uh, you know the movie Malignant? Yes, yes, yeah. That was James Great James film. James Wan said that was his version of Giallo. So there's a shot when they show in the attic, and it shows the killer's outfit is like hanging there. Mm -hmm. It pans up, and it's the it's the trench coat, and you know the the leather gloves are actually almost taken directly from from Deep Red. You should see them. Deep Red's considered like the greatest Giallo. And um, as it pans up. There's a fedora hanging there, even though you never see the character wearing a fedora. And that's just because it's a nod. To, he's like, see, it's oh, OK. Oh, cool. Very cool. So there's a lot of things there to unpack in terms of a genre, which is no, no, that's absolutely awesome. That is absolutely awesome. Like, because uh, you can see why I uh, 
get confused with what is and what is. I mean, I nice think Slasher Street, you know, you know what you're getting with a slasher, you know, it's just easy peasy. Yeah. Uh, so what is the, the not that there's a difference, but what is kind of, well, yeah, I suppose, what is the difference between a giallo from like the 60s, 70s, I suppose like a classic giallo and what you're creating with a, with a queer right. giallo? So you were saying before about um, new, new uh, territory. Mm -hmm. so there, there is one. F first of all, a queer giallo is just, you know, from a queer perspective. Giallo films had a disproportionate amount of queer characters, given the era that they were made versus anything, any other sh genre or subgenre that was out there. Shit ton of queer characters. And they're always, they're often integral to the plot, but the representation of those characters was stereotyped and awful. So queer gel is just like hand that subgenre to queer people and let them tell if you're going to have all these queer characters mm -hmm. that are important to the plot, why don't you let a queer person tell that story? You know, <coughs> It's, it's almost like Giallo was appropriated from queer people, but ahead of time because queer people, it's like predates, you know, it was already created as something that uh, was voicing queer characters without any queer people giving input. Yeah. And um, there has been one in terms of like prominent, a prominent film that anybody would have heard of uh, called Knife and Heart. Uh, that you know it was pretty popular Vanessa Parody stars in it it was um, it was nominated for a couple few awards at Cannes and that's a giallo that's all entirely queer it's like a queer story pretty much everybody in the film is queer um, but that's just a, it's a throwback film right it's 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 a period piece um, that's not what we're looking to do we're looking to do something modern that has the visual language of giallo carries the narrative tradition of giallo but is told from from a queer perspective and it's our queer stories mm -hmm. that's awesome that is awesome so because a lot i think i, I on the uh, the indiegogo campaign i was reading that you know you that a lot of uh giallo films especially back in the 60s 70s they like you've just said there they have a lot of queer characters in there but they are misrepresented mm -hmm. uh you know as uh, as uh as the, the killers or as kind of comedy characters or uh, even worse in some respects and that kind of thing. So is this kind of you putting that right, you know, given this a, 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 a correct representation essentially of, you know, queer people are, are in this genre? In a way, I guess I, I try to tread carefully around that, that type of <coughs> language, like correcting mm. things. Um, but it's more just motivated by by like what I was saying. It it there was so much queerness in this genre, subgenre. Mm -hmm. um, it just see it just makes sense that you, queer people would would make it their own, right? Yeah. That's that's all it is. I'm not I'm not really trying to be like, oh, I'm upset about this bad representation because I, I love a lot of those movies. I watch those. Like even the super duper offensive ones. Like there's one that I think I mentioned in the, the pitch deck called who saw her die. It actually stars George Lazenby. Um, you know, one time James Bond, George Lazenby <laughs> in an Italian horror film. And yeah, that's where his career went. And <laughs> yeah, the, the, killer in it i'm spoiling it obviously it's the killer is being revealed right now is a cross-dressing he's a queer character he's a cross-dressing priest who murders children and is the central figure in a pedophile sex cult and mm. you know when they kill him they burn him to death and throw him out of a, a balcony <laughs> out of a window. Oh my God. <laughs> it's just like it's to me it's the it's so offensive that it's hilarious uh -huh. so I, I I don't watch something like that and like oh feel hurt by it. It's just hilarious. It's <laughs> it's so laughable. I, I I'm not trying to say that it's that that negative representations of any marginalized group are okay. And I understand obviously how I'm as a queer person myself. I understand how that can lead to real violence against against queer people. That repeated representations of that type are problematic. 
but I'm just saying my own motivations aren't coming from like, a, I'm mad about this genre. If they're just coming from a, this is such a queer genre. There's so much queer stuff going on. Like you've, it's Suspiria visually. Like if somebody told you that the director of that film, if you didn't know who Dario Gento was, if somebody told you that the director of that film was flamboyantly gay, you would have been yeah. like, that makes so <laughs> much sense, right? <laughs> it would seem obvious. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's my, where my motivation is coming from. Just like, why are there not tons of queer people making these movies? That makes no sense to me. Yeah, that's awesome. So I mean, um, so how did this journey start for you? Like, so where did the idea of Bath Bomb kind of start and grow for you? Um, yeah, so I had, um, I've always wanted to do a queer giallo. And um, after seeing Knife plus heart that was kind of the first time that i was like okay this is it seems like there's an audience for this even if it ends up just being like a bit of a more highbrow european audience and maybe north mm -hmm. americans aren't going to be that interested that's still cool it give it may, it was the first time i thought like this is something we, i could actually do at some point i wasn't actively pursuing it and um i was at a film festival in the states uh, called film quest and they do this um event called filmmaker speed dating and I met um, a writer during the filmmaker speed dating named uh, Michael Clifton. And there, we didn't have like a, we during the very brief speed dating meeting, we didn't have like a project that we were like, let's do that. But we knew that we liked each other. We stayed in, in touch. He sent me a, a number of projects that he had written that hadn't been produced yet. One of them was a one minute short called bath bomb that he had written specifically for a one minute screenplay competition and its final image was a very giallo image that i can't share without ruining our film and uh but <laughs> it didn't seem like the story had been given enough room to to be its own story be because he was writing it specifically for this one minute constraint so we discussed expanding it and ended up expanding it to to five minutes um fleshing out kind of the giallo elements as well in that during that expansion. And then I, um, you know, once we had a script we liked, um, if you like a script a lot when you're finished with it, you're just, well, I need to make this right now. So that's, yeah, I started, I, I built a pitch deck that kind of explained, the pitch deck is like an a lot more elaborated version of the, the body text from our, our campaign page. Mm -hmm. uh, it just goes into more detail. But with the same, a lot of the same videos linked explaining giallo, explaining violence in giallo, explaining eroticism in giallo, visual conventions for people who, you know, I'm trying to pitch it to who don't know any, what any of that is, and started putting together a team. First, found some private money, um, found, uh, uh, pitched it to Movie Maker magazine, and they became involved um, in a financial and um, advocacy capacity. And then expanded from there, pulled in a cinematographer and composer. I don't know if you want me to mention. Yeah, let's just, well, who, like, who's involved and all that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, awesome. So we have uh, our cinematographer is um, Jeremy Benning, who is primarily known to the world. Well, not primarily, but most widely known to the world as uh, from The Expanse. I don't know if you've seen that, that series. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he, that, yeah. He came on early on that show and created the look for it and then was the primary cinematographer for all six seasons, which is rare in television. You often have various different cinematographers throughout a, a series. Um, he's also shot episodes of The Boys. Um, he did two episodes of Guillermo del Toro's Cabin of Curiosities, including yeah. um, uh, Anna Lily Emmerpore's episode, which is my favorite episode of the series. And he right now he's shooting um, Cross, which is... Um, a series based on uh, James Patterson's Alex Cross novels, which were like, they were movies in the, in the nineties, like kiss mm -hmm. the girls and along came a spider. Morgan, oh, yeah, yeah, Morgan yeah. Freeman playing the league. So that's a series now with Amazon. They're shooting it right now. So when he, that our schedule is based on him finishing that, and then we'll shoot this. And um, our composer is uh composers, uh, Teresa Wayman, who's a founding member of, um, war paint which is um a, a pretty popular indie rock band mm -hmm. um from the states uh, and her her brother ivan 
who's a producer and engineer who's worked with, uh, in addition to war paint has also worked with like, uh, Adele and the killers and, um, Beck and Weezer and Carly Rae Jepsen wow. and father John Misty and, and a bunch of folks. And, um, you were mentioning before, like musically things that are giallo. So, you know, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of giallo is like Ennio Morricone and Resort Alani and Stelvio Cipriano and like jazz based lounge based mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So even though that's not what they normally do musically, that's what they're doing for this. So they're going to make um, a, a jazz and lounge based score uh, uh, for for Bath Bomb. And uh, you can buy it on vinyl from our campaign. Oh, OK. That's both, awesome. Both in a normal standard edition and a limited edition signed by by Teresa and Ivan. That's uh, a cool book. That is a really yeah. cool book. So what um, whilst, we're, whilst you've kind of touched on it there kind of what is what are some of the perks that people can get on the uh, the indiegogo campaign so we have kind of the standard indiegogo um oh i'll mention because i think you know him um uh vincent desanti yes yes so yeah. he, yeah. Well, he is our, he's our crowdfunding producer oh okay because i was going to ask as well that was also a question i was going to ask was uh how did you and Vincent kind of get in touch to get that arranged because Vincent is the king of Indiegogo campaigns. Like he, he is just... also he is also like the great connector in in <laughs> independent horror. You know, yes, he knows yeah, everybody, he and he's just such a nice guy. Yeah, he's happy to bring people together. So he, I met Vince Vinny at uh, Mod's Pizzeria in Provo, Utah. <laughs> that's a random place to meet someone <laughs> it, was, it was during it was during a film festival and i didn't know who he was and he was sitting there eating pizza and i was eating pizza and there's nowhere else in the place and i knew he was at the festival and i was at the festival so we started talking and we you know we liked each other and he is also into metal and um he had some he had a friend of his going to psycho that year uh for a bachelor party and uh, and he was already going with them and they already had their passes. But I, I told them, you know, I'd, I'd give them a hookup. So at Psycho that year, I went down and introduced myself. And then in kind of unnecessarily dramatic fashion, I had scissors and I cut their wristbands off <laughs> and then gave them like VIP wristbands, you know. So oh, like, excellent. Right there, <laughs> their experience. Um and uh, yeah, so we were friends um, based on, on those interactions. And when we wanted to do this and decided that we wanted to, you know, we already had, as I had mentioned, private money and some money from Movie Maker involved. We, we needed more. Um, so we decided to do a, a crowdfunding campaign and he was an obvious person to talk to about it. And uh, yeah, then he just came on board as a, as a crowdfunding producer. That's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, if there's a man that you want kind of running an Indiegogo campaign, he is the man to do it. Like his yeah, great. Never Hike Alone 2 is like well over $250,000 now. It's just absolutely insane. So, yeah. And uh, from all intents and purposes, from what I could see, the Indiegogo campaign has been um, a huge success so far. And we're at 88% as of now. Um, well, don't jinx it. <laughs> okay, we'll touch touch wood. We'll touch wood. Um, so oh, oh, I just refreshed ninety two percent. Oh my goodness! So it's looking pretty good that that's gonna hit. Stop with the jinxing. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did want to ask though, just about the Indiegogo campaign. Now, now I'm going I'm gonna re I'm gonna twist that jinx on its head here. Okay. <laughs> if you don't hit the goal of twenty five thousand dollars. Because yeah. I, I think that's the that's the flexi goal at the moment, twenty five thousand. Correct. Um, will that affect anything for you, or will it still go ahead as planned? Or it's going to go ahead as planned. It's going to go ahead regardless. Um, I mean, even if we hit the goal, we'll go into in demand, and we're going to continue to try raising funds. If you read the campaign, like the ultimate goal would be to get more like sixty k out of mm -hmm. out of the crowdfunding campaign, and um, as uh, once the campaign's over and we're in in demand, we'll we'll keep trying to raise funds through through the campaign. Uh, you know the way in demand works, right? It's it's still yeah. open 
essentially indefinitely as long as you keep getting some level of of contributions each month. Um, but we'll, we'll also look for other private sources of money um, to just to get us where where we want to be. It's I know it sounds a little crazy. We're talking about a five minute movie, and you're we're just saying that this is at 25 K and we also have private money and money from movie maker. And we're like, how, how much are you guys spending on this? It's, it is, it, we're spending quite a bit on it. Um, but it's because we want the, the, the main point of it is we're trying to establish this visual language that we're then going to put into expand into a feature world. So mm -hmm. there's no point in, in doing it for less than, the best it could be you know yeah like there is a there's even a ten thousand dollar version of this movie if you wanted to but that's not going to sell what it's supposed to look like on a feature level so mm -hmm. we need this to look like what it's supposed to look like on a feature level or there's no point in doing it at all because that's the point of this short um so so yeah it's it'll be an expensive five minutes yeah but if it's gonna look good you know that's and that's you know one of, one of the reasons we were we needed extra money to do a crowdfunding campaign also is once you start bringing in people like Jeremy Benning like obviously dude coming off of uh, Cabinet of Curiosities that you know he was nominated for an American Cinematographer Society Award for you're not paying him what you pay and his crew also <laughs> what what <laughs> you were gonna what you're gonna pay you know your friend cinematographer or even even people that. I would have potentially brought in from 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 music videos. It's it's it's, it's still a different world, right? Yeah, yeah, um, so, totally different ball game. Totally different ball game. Yeah, a show, um, a show like that, uh, the world that Jeremy's coming from is like the the top essentially in yeah, terms of yeah. um, production value. Yeah, and you get what you pay for as well. You know, you yeah, get the best. And uh, so um, so yeah, so what um, so ninety two ninety two percent did you just say that ninety two percent? That's where right now. Awesome. That is fantastic. So for people who want to get involved, uh, what uh, what is on offer on the Indiegogo campaign? Like what what would you recommend? What is available? Uh, what would I recommend? Recommend everything. <laughs> Executive producer credit for $5,000. That's that would my be recommendation it. to all listeners. Um, <laughs> no, uh, we yeah, we have various credits, you know, starting from a special thank you credit for 100 and then there's an associate producer. Um, those might be sold out. Uh, yes, I think they are. Okay. Um, there were associate producer credits for 250. There is co-producer, producer, and executive producer. The executive producer credit is the only thing we haven't sold any of. I'm not shocked. It's five thousand dollars, but oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the producer credit for 2500 we have sold. Um, no, they're not sold out, so you can still get one. But uh, but we have sold. Um, you can get uh, any of the credit. Uh, perks come with a digital package, which is um, a digital screener of the film, um, digital version of the score, PDF of the script, comes with a crew t-shirt um, and a print of the poster. Oh, our poster, our poster was uh, designed by Creepy Duck, who awesome. is the best horror poster person in the game, if you're aware of him. Yes, I, I am very much aware. Yes, yeah. yeah. He did, you know, Barbarian, Mandy, Terrifier 2, Smile, last two Scream movies, the Hellraiser reboot, um, more. Yeah. <laughs> Bath Bomb. He did Bath Bomb. Bath Bomb. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's very, it's very eye catching. And uh, yeah. yeah, it is very, very, very eye catching. He's also incredible to work with. If anybody's looking for a poster, uh, he's great responds immediately to emails there's no you know argument over uh when you have notes and uh oftentimes if i would had a note about something that was like really nitpicky instead not only would he respond within a few hours to the email but the note he'd already be have made the change um you know he'd already have that the new draft which is perfect that's that's awesome. Uh, I like a lot of his work. It's it's very um, VHS 
classic VHS cover. Yeah. That that kind of is the the vibe I always get with his work, and it's just in horror. And I say this so many times on the podcast: the the poster gets the people through the door. Like, oh, yeah. I'm not saying this is going to be the case for Bath Bomb at all, but <laughs> I've seen it in the past where you know, even if the movie is is not really that great the poster gets people through the door because it's an awesome poster it's an awesome yeah. poster and i'm sure that won't be the case with bath bomb but uh, <laughs> that is uh, in horror that happens so much it, it... <laughs> yeah uh, more than you would think um so in terms of bath bomb what can people expect what well, i think we've kind of touched on it you know with the, the jello and the aspects and stuff like that so what uh, it's only five minutes but what can people expect when they go into this what kind of what will what will you have in store um well kind of like that last bit of the the summary there's um there's violence it the violence happens suddenly and is very violent <laughs> and um <laughs> the there's man flesh definitely mm -hmm. there's naked dude going on uh there is humor um and it's campy but it's not enough to make you cringe i mean unless mm -hmm. you just have a zero tolerance for camp <laughs> and um it's going to be shot beautifully it's going to have a it's it's modern day it's not a period piece but it has there's going to be a retro vibe to it we're bringing back a lot of um set pieces that you would expect to see in jello like there's there's mm -hmm. a reel to reel player that's what the music is playing on um we're doing with the score we're doing uh something that was common in in giallo is that the score is playing on a diegetic source like in the in the room there's oh, yeah. you see when the scene starts he somebody presses play on the reel to reel and that's how the music plays but then as the the scene goes on the music changes to to match the emotional tone of the scene which obviously makes no sense if it's playing on the thing but that they used to do that in giallo and was very weird uh so we're doing that as well and um, yeah, a lot, like fun, uh, well th thought out. Um, th the cameras, everything was really not over choreographed, mm -hmm. maybe over choreographed, but <laughs> very choreographed in Giallo. So yeah, uh, there's no shots that are kind of like just standard coverage. Everything is is um, you know like long zooms and uh, snap inserts to think like really claustrophobic snap mm -hmm. thirds to things and um we're gonna do some uh split diopter stuff i don't know if you're familiar but with the you know if you say if you had two one person standing at the end of the room and one person standing right in the front mm -hmm. of the camera you use a split diopter in your lens so that both are in focus but oh, there's okay. like a cool. third uh gradient between them where the where the glass is split um yeah so just fun yeah that's awesome, yeah. and um, I kind of want this to be longer than five minutes, just the way you talk about it. But it, this sounds this sounds brilliant. So, well, uh, if it goes well, and we get to make the feature, then yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. be longer than five minutes. You'll get to, if it goes as well as we're hoped. We have three features planned. Oh, today. excellent! So you'll get to see three features with the same shooting style and progressively more bizarre stories. Yeah. And so I was going to ask, actually, is this? Um, so obviously, you said there the plan is to make this into a feature. Is is Bath Bomb going to be the kind of the uh, the the catalyst of a feature? Is like this just like a small, essentially a scene within the feature uh, itself? Have you seen the Mortuary Collection? Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah. I, Ryan Spindle, sure. uh, I met him on the festival circuit. The guy directed and wrote those. Um, you know, that's unlike a lot of anthologies. He did all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the frame narrative so the, the plan for this is we're kind of doing the what he did where he made the the babysitter murders first and then you know that went around to festivals and then mm -hmm. made the mortuary collection with the babysitter sitter murders as one of the shorts in the anthology mm -hmm. so we want to do a giallo anthology and bath bomb would be one of the the shorts in in the anthology nice nice it helps because then you're going to festivals with like this is what you know 
it's like you're going to festivals with a trailer in a way for the feature that you're trying to get money for because you're like this is the style that it's going to be we can already pull it off here it is yeah yeah awesome you mentioned as well this is just this is just something that just kind of came to my head there a little bit in terms of uh what's on show in the film are we going full frontal man flesh full frontal on screen <laughs> um yes and no i can't okay. really say why yes and no okay because that's always something that i always i, I always think about when i'm watching a, a slasher film or anything. The, not that I'm complaining, not that I'm complaining at all, because, you know, I am uh, I am a heterosexual male, so I enjoy <laughs> naked ladies, of course. But there is a very severe lack of naked men as well, in I feel, in, in horror films. It's very true. You know, it's just kind of like uh, us uh, kind of heterosexual males get the, the better deal of it, because we always see a naked woman in a film, but there's hardly any naked men, and I don't know why that is. I think I've only seen like two penises in a film two or three like on screen it's uh it's hard the, the other thing too is yeah you know there's like um there's a lot there's a long history of violence being inflicted on a nude female body in horror mm -hmm. and uh somebody's gotta catch up with violence inflicted on a nude male body totally, totally. And we're, we're here to help start that Nice. Now, I always said, I actually also, I actually said, I, I met uh, D uh, Damien Leone at a convention in uh, Manchester, obviously, terror, the guy who did the Terrifier films, and there's the the very well-known scene the of uh, scene. <clears throat> the Thor scene in the original film, and I said, there's one way to up that scene, and he's, oh, how? He's like, make that a man in Terrifier 3, because <laughs> that yeah. would... Oh, that would make so many people wince. Like you know, oh, it's bad enough when it's a woman, but if you had a man naked, upside down, with a with a rusty saw going down there, geez, oh, like that would that happened in uh, the hell's it called? There's a western movie. Um, it's not even a horror, but it has horror qualities. They they come across that um, what the hell is it's it Bone called? Tomahawk? Yeah, Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. They saw a dude in half the same way. Yeah. It's a great scene. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I wanted to, I did want to ask you just, just a little bit off topic. Um, well, actually, before I get onto this question, what I wanted to ask was um, about kind of the gore in the film. Because while we're talking about Bath Bomb, we'll still stick on to this for a second. But in terms of the gore in the film, what can people expect from, from that kind of aspect of it? Because I think it's five minutes, but there's only two characters. So uh, presumably one of them is going to have a lot of bad shit happen to them. Uh, so, so the, the you know, final, the, Actually, there's two. There are two images that you haven't seen before that'll be in the movie in terms of gore. Um, one, one of which is the final image that we we think will really stick in people's. But I can't say anything about it. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's totally cool. That's totally well. That's exciting for me anyway. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing whatever that is. So, <laughs> um, but what I did want to ask actually. You know, this is a this is a queer Jalo film, and I just wanted to ask you about queer representation in in films today and TV shows today. Um, and obviously, we have we've come a long way, <laughs> kind of, you know, as a society. Um, whilst yeah, also we... not coming anywhere <laughs> as well, we're kind of at a red light, but it feels like we're getting somewhere. So, how do you feel about that in terms of you know queer representation in movies and in TV shows today? Do you think we're on? the right track or do you, how do you feel you know as a queer male that that is today it's it's hard to 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 judge of in terms of like are we on the right track because defining we gets tough it's when 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 you try to think we as inclusive of all of society that's like i don't know uh, that's hard mm -hmm. I on another podcast recently was talking about um, The Last of Us and um, I do think that on the creative side of things there seems to be a lot of creative people who are um, happy to include and are including more queer stories um, in in projects and have gone beyond the stage of 
having queer characters where their whole existence in the project is just about the fact that they're queer. Cause mm-hmm. I don't consider that progress. That's just, you know, yeah. if, if that's it, because the, the point of inclusion, whether you're talking about a queer person, a black person, a trans person, a elderly person is it's, sh- should be just that they're a character like any other character a person with with disabilities as well it should they should Mm -hmm. real inclusion is you're not putting them in a film to talk about what makes them different from everybody else yeah and um there are it seems that there are people who who are are interested in in doing that but um the the response from the general public still seems to be stupid like mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. what i was talking about on the previous podcast was how the um uh what's his face parks and rec <laughs> um oh yeah i know you um I, I don't actually know the actor's name but uh he played bill in the last of us yeah the bill episode of of the 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 last of us everybody seemed to think was like the best episode of that series myself Mm -hmm. included and then uh nick offerman that's his name and then uh on on ratings sites i still haven't checked to see if this is still the case but when the show was still in the midst of airing that episode was the lowest rated episode on rating sites because anti-queer people ratings bombed it Mm -hmm. and so that's where i feel like trying to say where are are we on the right track it doesn't seem like there's a we to talk about Mm -hmm. because it seems like the people making content are on the right track but the people consuming content are a different we and Mm -hmm. they're maybe not ready i'm not saying every, nobody in the world is supporting these stories because obviously a lot of people love that and it wouldn't have been made if there wasn't an audience for it but it's a pretty powerful element of people who don't want their content all gayed up you know <laughs> <laughs> and i i mean i don't also i don't want to i don't want to be like complaining or get negative no. but this campaign that we've been doing Starting on day two of the campaign, we've got daily uh, DMs on our Instagram account and comments on various platforms that are homophobic and anti-queer. And, you know, we've j- I've just been deleting them. I, yeah. Some of them are still up because some of them are harder to delete. Like sometimes on Twitter, they just like gray it out and you can't actually delete it. Um, but yeah, everything from like, uh, you know, Horror, horror doesn't need to be gay and first of all I, queer is not necessarily the same thing as gay there's a whole yeah. <laughs> umbrella of things that is queer that is not necessarily gay but and when you say something like that it reveals how well how well you know yeah, yeah. what 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 uh the que- queer community is um every everything from that to, to like you know just straight up ignorant stupid shit like one person dm'd us on our bathroom instagram account that they they hope we die (laughs) like what the fuck is wrong with people (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, well i'll tell you what i'll tell you right now i'll look because i'll be putting this on my insta like and you know although i've been pretty quiet on the instagram i'll be honest the last few weeks but i'll be putting this on the instagram i'll look forward to getting those messages you know why are you supporting this and all this kind of shit (sighs) what is wrong with people? Like, why does that matter? Why does that offend you? And the problem is you can't have a discussion like that with people like that. They're just completely ignorant. They're completely tone deaf to, you know, and as you say, whilst there's people like that, but I always try and think that that is a small, I try and think that that is a small representation of society. It's, and unfortunately these ignorant people, tend to be the loudest and that's that's the annoying thing yeah but i mean i i mean you don't live in in the states uh i -hmm. mean i don't live in the states either i live in in canada but i spend a lot of time in the states i grew up in the states (laughs) and it's not as small like it's a powerful voice in the states i don't know how much you've follow american news but there's a lot of 
there's a an anti-queer movement in the states that's growing in strength in terms you know there's the anti-drag movement and anti-trans rights movement um and now like the don't say gay thing that's that's you know there's don't say gay legislation being passed in in some states in in the united states right now and um yeah it's 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 pretty it's pretty crazy i was gonna yeah. backtrack for a second though to say like these people are just like ignorant or i've actually this campaign has been interesting just because i've gotten that's what i've always assumed too but there's some people who have actual like arguments for why they don't think we should make this although i will say if you're gonna take the time to dm a, an account for a short film like a paragraph like several paragraphs of something maybe even if it does sound like a thought out argument you're still probably got some, some something loose yeah, uh, yeah but you know people have made arguments in our in our dms about um one of the the hallmarks of of giallo is like naked women and that you know if you change that that's not giallo anymore mm. and i i get how they think that's logic but in reality, that's just because they're only thinking of things in like a heterosexual versus anything else world. Mm -hmm. In reality, if you take a step back, it's the hallmark is nudity. Yeah. yeah. Not naked women. It's just if nudity is is really the, the point of that element is 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 a sexual point. But if you're not thinking of an audience that's just straight people, then nothing about the structure of that necessitates it to be a woman yeah um so anyway i, I not i didn't i didn't respond with that by the way i no, no. deleted the, 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 <laughs> blocked the person and moved on with my life but um yeah I it's, think it's, 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 it's interesting it's, that some of these people think that they have like arguments for why yeah. a queer yeah. giallo should not exist yeah yeah and <laughs> it, it is it, it is beyond belief and unfortunately as you say that Donald, I'm not going to get, try and get too political here, but Donald Trump has a lot to answer for for all this kind of nonsense that's going on in America at the moment. The social divide, it is, I suppose it's always been there, but unfortunately, he seems to have made people think it's okay to like air these views as if it's a, as if you're saying, oh, do you like, chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream let's have a discussion about that it's like no you're, you're being homophobic and that's not good that's not how society should be even if you have those thoughts and it's 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 beyond belief and touching on it there um you know they say about you know how it shouldn't be there was the light year film that bombed uh the disney light year film because there was a lesbian character in that film it's a kid's film and like, oh, kids shouldn't be seeing this. And it's like, but that's a true representation of the world. Like yeah. if you don't show them There's that. There's no difference between kids seeing a gay relationship and a straight relationship. Exactly. Exactly. There's, it, it, there's it, sex involved in both. And that's the only part that's not, you know, kid friendly it's yeah and they definitely don't show that in yeah. the, in the film so, yeah i'm guessing there's no <laughs> lesbian sex scene in that movie no and uh it, it like it, it's something that really affects me i have a lot of i have a lot of gay friends and you know it's it's uh it's something that really pisses me off when i see uh some of the shit that you read and uh, as you say a lot of it was brought to the attention from the uh, the bill and frank episode of the last of us which was an absolute yeah. masterpiece i was in tears at the end of that episode yeah. and the, um, the, the other one too where they show ellie's past um yeah where that was yeah exactly <laughs> in the but mall, the thing yeah. is that was in the game both parts of that i mean fair enough the bill and frank episode was extended we only saw bill we saw bill in a slightly different light in the game but he was still gay we we knew he was gay in the game it's it's openly referenced and uh, the last of us is a dlc where it pretty much played out play by play as they showed it so people shouldn't be going into this uh, thinking oh my god they what agenda are they throwing at us here it's like no this is this was this was in the game that came out 10 years ago that they are that's yeah. their source material it it oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was another that was another comment we talked you just used the term agenda that was another uh comment that we got on instagram was that um uh something along the lines of like and here i thought um 
indie horror was one thing that the gay agenda wouldn't ruin. <laughs> <laughs> what agenda? What? I wanted to keep that one up just to see other people interact with. But then I was like, because that one was a comment, not a DM. But then I was like, no, because the flip side of that is other people who agree with him might. Yeah, there is that, that as well. So I yeah, it. there is that. I was just, it's absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. So it's a, one of those where, you know, we're coming. We, I, I did feel like five years ago, six years ago, we were getting to a point in society where we felt like we were moving forward and um, everything was just kind of becoming more, um, I don't want to use the word tolerant because there's nothing to tolerate, but, you know, in terms of like just living our lives, how people want to live their lives, whether, you know, whatever, you know, their kind of sexual orientation or anything, just letting people live their lives how they want to. And in this past four or five years, it just seems to have gone decades the other way, which is so frustrating. I think that, I think, you know, I think it swings back and forth a lot. And it's just that our, <laughs> each of us has a, a lifespan that's only catching a chunk of each of those swings. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like, yeah, everything's going to be great now. I'm sure there's some people who like on their deathbed, it was when things were swinging in the right direction. Yeah. The world's going to be okay. And then, death. yeah. And then, I am leaving this world a better place. <laughs> yeah, they they didn't see that like a few years later it just swung right back. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is very true. But you know, kind of what I don't understand as well, and uh, we're kind of going a bit off topic here. But t- um, one of my favorite characters in any film ever made is Tim Curry in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which came out in the nineteen yeah. seventies, and uh, the seventh thing was the seventies, and. Uh, you, you know that was, and that today, you the people who who like they probably comment on uh, your posts or send hateful messages. I bet you anybody at their party they're doing the time warp. <laughs> and, and I don't know. I I guarantee they're the people that are so hardcore in their no queerness thing that they don't allow Rocky Horror references yeah. probably in their life. Yeah, it's probably yeah. just like Toby Keith or go home kind of thing in their house. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. But uh, but anyway, we've got we've gone completely off top of there. I've got uh, I've got my frustration. I'll be uh, it's, it's very interesting to talk about, and we could probably talk about that for hours, really, in, ter- in terms of <laughs> and not solve anything, and still not solve anything. <laughs> exactly, and still not solve anything, and uh, that's the thing. So um, so anyway, just to I've uh, got a couple more questions, and we'll wrap up because uh, yeah, we've gone. Really, really good amount of time there. We've got an hour and 22 minutes already. So a couple more questions, then we'll wrap up, Colin. Um, when do you anticipate the movie, uh, the, 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 movie the short, being released? Because um, obviously I don't think it's started filming yet. So yeah. when when do you think this will all be ready for everyone to see? Yeah, the aim is to film second weekend of June. And um, our target for completion is to be ready in time to submit to um, Sitges, which is uh deadline is July 17th. Um, so then like fall festival circuit, like genre festival circuit is, is the aim. Awesome. And uh, do you have a cast lined up and everything? Is that uh, cause you got your crew? Do you have a cast or we do not? Um, hopefully going to start the ball rolling and casting this coming week. Um, we had some leads originally that we pursued that didn't work out for, for one reason or another. Um, just difficulty of approaching more known actors when you have a project that is not uh, financially um, can't, can't compete financially with, mm-hmm. with a project that is, you know, weeks or months of work. Uh, so yeah, we, we had some some folks that we were pushing for that that took longer contracts that were given to them. So uh, so now we have to we're going to have to do like a real mm. like through a casting director, like an actual casting process. Oh, OK, cool. Very good. Very good. So and uh, so, yeah. And uh, when where one thing I want to know is where will people see because you're not offering a uh, like a DVD or a Blu-ray or anything like that for this because it's just a short um, on the Indiegogo. There's a digital 
download that you can get. So will this be available anywhere else um, in terms of like, will it so only be those backers we'll, or? We'll, we'll do the, anybody who has a, a credit um, or who has purchased the, the digital uh, bath uh, package, they will get a digital screener of it when it's, when our initial festival run is, is finished. Mm-hmm. Um, potentially earlier, we, we're just navigating the, the whole like rights um, rules because mm-hmm. you, you can be, you can dequalify yourself from festivals if, if uh, your project gets out there. Um, it's really just a matter of like, will a backer, take the digital copy that we give them, find mm. a way to pull the rights blocking off of it and then put it on the internet, which uh, I don't think people are going to do that, but it we're probably not going to give the digital screeners to people until after the initial festival run, just in case. Mm-hmm. Will it be going on YouTube or anything like that afterwards or it just be, just be the digital? Most likely. Yeah, most likely not because of the fact that we want it to become part of this the first feature, um, the anthology feature. Because that would mm-hmm. no, you would no one would let us do that <laughs> if it was part of the feature was already available online. So um, uh, yeah, we'll we'll probably um, the other than backers of the campaign, the rest of the world will see it either at festivals or when it's part of a feature in a couple of, in a couple of years. Awesome. Well, that actually is a great incentive to people out there to back it because if you back it, you get to see the movie. If you don't back it or the, the short, I keep saying, I keep saying movie. I just keep saying that, but uh, the short, the short movie. Um, if you don't back it, you're going to be waiting years. So potentially uh, to see it. So yeah, absolutely. Everyone get out there. I suppose we're going to put the links in the show notes as well uh, on YouTube. And I'll also put the link in the show notes on the podcast. So anyone watching and listening to this, uh, check out the link below. And also uh, fingers crossed, touching the wood again, uh, that if we do reach the demand, even if you are, listening to this kind of in a week or two's time the campaign will hopefully touch wood again still be live still be open in demand so you can contribute afterwards but to guarantee it do it before 3 a.m eastern on on saturday so uh that's awesome now uh colin so last question uh what is next for you after bath bomb kind of what is your plans is it just straight into this anthology or do you have anything else lined up <clears throat> that would be that would be the the dream straight into the anthology but yeah. i also need to pay my rent and eat food so um i still work in television um i just finished editing a series and um will probably seek further editorial work editing is less of a uh when i'm working on my own projects on the side like this i can't really i don't have the creative bandwidth to also be directing other stuff but editing i can um so yeah probably be looking for some other editing contracts awesome awesome and uh, is that just like your your gig you just freelance editing and yeah man yeah that is awesome (laughs) i would love that uh sense of freedom i'm locked down to the old nine to five and uh (laughs) That's why I do gigs and uh, promote stuff to kind of give myself a bit of, uh, and this podcast to kind of give myself a bit of, uh, you know, freedom outside of the old ball and chain that is nine to five. So that is that is very cool. Um, where can people find you, Colin, in terms of social media and stuff? Uh, where you where can me? people keep keep on keep give tabs my address on you? <laughs> um, where can keep tabs on you? <laughs> I I have a website that is just colingcooper.com. Uh, Colin G. Cooper, all one word. Uh, and I am on Instagram at Colin G. Cooper, all one word. And that is the only social media I use. I have a Facebook and a Twitter, but I don't use them. So if you follow me, you will not get anything in return. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Colin, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. We've got an yeah, hour and a great. half there. And uh, it's been awesome to chat with you and uh, talk all things Bath Bomb and tangents and everything in between so um yeah thank you so much for coming on the show thank you and i 
really hope Bath Bomb is a massive, massive, massive success, which I, I think it will be, to be honest with you. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. 